to hear today. Hey, I'm also so great, so blessed. I don't know how many of you remember uh, a number of years ago, there was a movie by Liam Nielsen called Taken, and it, it put sex trafficking on the map. It just is amazing. Who would, have, who would have thought that a Hollywood movie would have awakened the conscience of America to a new degree? It really did. Before, you really didn't hear about it much. But since then, but this has been going on for a long time. And there's sex tourism and horrible things that take place. The children are abused uh, horrifically. And we have a, we have a gentleman uh, here today, his, his wife and himself, and Beth and Dave Grant, are missionaries to India and other parts of Nepal and other, other parts of the, of the world. And what they do, they rescue the most vulnerable people that you can imagine, children. It's an amazing, amazing ministry that I am very proud, in a good sense of the word, to be a part of, that we can participate in what God is doing around the world and around here. And so, should I show the video first, and then I'll introduce you? Okay, let's go ahead and show the little video that explains what Project Rescue is. Let's go ahead. Project Rescue is rooted in the history of this ancient land. For a thousand years, there have been girls trafficked out of the tribes of Nepal to the harems of the kingdoms of India. In India, women are not considered equal. They're considered, in many cases, children of a lesser God. Project Rescue was born in Bombay, India. Now in Europe and in the Middle East and in Asia, Project Rescue is impacting this generation of young women who have been sold into sexual slavery and forced prostitution. And this today is where we are, giving value to the girls born in brothels, giving value to the girls who are not considered valuable, but God considers them valuable. They're His daughters. The key to rescuing women and children from sexual slavery is relationships. Because of this relationship that we've been building, they'll open the home for us to come and teach us the Bible studies. The customer would come, the Rotten owner would tell the customer, you wait, they're having a Bible study. You know, just like we are being part of their life, we are there to help them. <laughs> When a woman or a child is rescued out of the Red Light District and comes into a Project Rescue Home of Hope, she begins to get the medical, the physical care she needs over a period of time. But she's also given an education, vocational training, and preparation to begin a new life in Jesus Christ. Prevention has been a key part of Project Rescue strategy from the very beginning. There are trainings to help people in the local church realize what is happening whenever any little daughter of a woman in the red light district is given to us to have a new life in a home of hope. That's prevention. Yesterday, we just completed our first ever conference in the city of Delhi. Over 80 leaders, church leaders, came together for the first time to hear about this huge need we are going to see thousands of women and children find freedom and new life in Jesus Christ. It's quite easy to physically rescue a woman or a child from the brothel. It's another thing to take them out of that and bring them into new life where they have a chance for a new future in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being a part of the solution, getting beyond talking to action. Thank you. All right, we're just so privileged today. Would you please give a warm um, welcome to David Grant. Dave, thanks for coming today. Thanks, Pastor Eric. John chapter 14 and verse 1 
There's a fabulous, wonderful scripture that I share with you right now. I think we'll have it up on the screen. And if we get it together, we'll read it together. It is my joy to be at Cornerstone Church today with you. It was raining this morning, and then the rain's cleared up, and this is just beautiful. I am delighted to be a friend of your pastor and his wife, and I thank God for their vision. And it was wonderful having their son, Luke, who's 11 years old, play the drums this morning. Wasn't that good? That was wonderful. And pastor, yeah, thank God. <laughs> Let's read together. Say it with me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. And the scripture continues, there is more. Oh, this is good. Say it with me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Now, underline the word place. We'll come back to it. Prepare a place for you. Let's continue. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said in him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Thomas, we call him the doubting apostle. And perhaps verbally he was. He and Peter just sort of blurted things out. I think some of the others had doubts. They just didn't say them. But Thomas did. How do we know? But what I love about Thomas was that in spite of his doubts, he traveled the farthest of all the apostles. Thomas went to India and was martyred in the city of Chennai 2,000 years ago. I was in Chennai, that same city, 40 years ago, and helped start a new church. We started with seven people. This morning, that church has 40,000 people in that church today. They will have 14 services today. The first service was at 5 o'clock this morning with 5,000 people. The blood of the martyr seeds the explosion of the church. Suffering brings incredible results. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back and get you and take you to the place that's been prepared for you. I'm a preacher's kid from Pensacola, Florida. I grew up going to church. My dad was one of those old-fashioned pastors who preached against everything. What could we do? Nothing. Where could we go? Nowhere. Where do we spend our time? Church. We had five services a week, and we didn't miss one of them. Church. Dad preached against television. Television, he said. He said, it's like a television, like a commode. Sitting in your living room, flushing sewage in the minds of your children. So we had to go to the deacon's house to watch TV. <laughs> when the kids got together to have church, or we got together to play in the neighborhood, we had church. And I was the preacher from six years of age. Our cat died. We had a wonderful funeral. I preached him into heaven. It was so good. We dug him up the next day and did it all over again. The third day we dug him up, Mama caught us. She said, bury that cat and leave him in peace. We cried because we heard a cat had nine lives. And our cat only got three funerals. Then Dad had all these, he had a huge garden and all these animals. And he had a dozen chickens in the backyard. Sunday night was a water baptismal service. Monday morning my brother said to me, the chickens aren't going to heaven. They haven't been baptized. I said, I will baptize the chickens. 
We couldn't find the water, but Dad had this huge container of gasoline beside the house. Dad came home, and all the chickens were dead. He screamed, who killed the chickens? We said, we didn't kill them. We baptized them, and God took them to heaven. That was my childhood. My dad loved missionaries, and he loved missions. We had a missionary every week, and they stayed in our home. And instead of television, we had missionary stories. Missionaries would sit around our dining room table and tell stories till midnight. It affected all five of us children. When I was 12 years old, a missionary came to my dad's church and told the story of a 12-year-old boy who had no money to put in the missionary offering at the end of the service. In those days, we used offering pans. And when the offering pan came by this 12-year-old boy, he took it and said, Jesus, I don't have any money, but you can have me. And he took the offering pan, and he laid it on the floor, and he stood up in the offering pan. And he said, Jesus, I will be the offering today. I will be the offering. That missionary said it was the greatest missionary offering we ever received, a 12-year-old boy standing in an offering pan. And when that missionary told that story, I was 12 years old. And that night at the end of his sermon, when they passed the offering pan, I said, God, if that other little boy can do it, so can I. And I took the offering pan, and I laid it on the floor. And I stood up in it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my 12-year-old heart and said, David, I want you to go to India. My destiny was set from the age of 12. I was on my way to India. At 17, I was traveling as an evangelist all over the state of Florida, preaching. And I made a vow to God that I would not marry for 13 years until I was at least 30 years of age. I said, God, for the next 13 years, you get every day and every dollar of my life. I turned 30 years of age, and I was preaching in Pennsylvania, a youth camp. And I walked on the platform. And I said to the director of the camp, who's the young lady playing the piano? That's my type. He said, yeah, her husband is leading the worship. I said, story of my life. When you're 30 years old, it seems like everybody's married. And so the worship leader, Brian Schaefer, became a great friend. We had a wonderful week of fellowship. He and his wife had been married for four years. They were both 25 years of age. I left that camp to go back to India for a year. Six weeks after that camp, my friend Brian was killed in an accident. And his wife, Beth, became a widow at 25 years of age. She stayed on at the church in Wilmington, Delaware, as a minister of music, minister of youth, principal of the school. A year later, I came back from India to find out that Brian had died. And I phoned Beth. And I said, I just heard that Brian died a year ago. I've been in India this year. I never knew, and I'm so sorry. How are you doing? This young widow said there is sadness, there's grief, but there's peace. My life is not my own. I gave my life to Jesus. Brian was not mine. He belonged to God. My life is not mine. It belongs to God. She said, David, we're like Our lives are like currency in the hands of God. He can spend us however he pleases. Whether our lives are long or short, what's important is, were they given to God? I was so captured by that sense of abandonment. Most of my life, you and I have heard people talk about my life, my happiness, my dreams, my fulfillment. My money, my house, my car, my job, my wife, my husband, my children, my grandchildren, mine, 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 mine. Now, actually, they, it's proper to say that. But actually, none of those things are ours. They are entrusted to us. Relationships, mates, children grandchildren are a trust from God. They're not our property. They belong to God, but they've been entrusted to our care. 
Our finances are not ours. God entrusted the finances to us. Everything that we have is a gift. And when we look at that as a gift, and how do we steward God's gifts? How do we steward God's gifts? And I was so intrigued by this young widow's sense of abandonment that I began to call and once a month and once a week and then every day. That year, there were 200 phone calls. We became best friends on the phone. I turned 31 years of age, and I said, God, I'm willing to be single all my life and give you every dollar for India. But if you ever want me to get married, I got a recommendation for you. There's this young widow in Wilmington, Delaware. And the moment I called her name in prayer, God spoke to me and said, that's the girl you're going to marry. I grabbed the phone and called my dad. I said, I'm getting married. He said, when? I said, I don't know, but I found her. He said, what is she like? Wonderful. What does she look like? Beautiful. But I haven't seen her in two years. The last time I saw her, she was married to somebody else. She's a widow. Dad said, I'll be praying for you. I hung up with Dad, and I called Beth. I said, could I take you to lunch tomorrow? She said, Sure. I was leaving for India the next night for six months of crusades. And I figured, i got to settle this today. And I flew 2,000 miles that morning and took her to lunch and proposed. Our first date, I said, I know this is going to sound strange, but I prayed through about it. It's God's will. I love you, and I'm going to marry you. She said, you're entitled to your opinion. I said, I'm not officially proposing. I'm just sharing with you that I'm leaving for India tonight. I'll be gone for six months, but I'll be in touch. I'd like to write to you, and I don't want you to write me back. I need to build a sense of trust beneath you that you can learn to love and trust again since Brian's death two years ago. For God is a God of the past, and the memories are treasures. And God is a God of the present, and all that we're in the middle of right now but he's also the God of the future. He's the God of new beginnings. And I'd like to write to you, and I do not want you to write me back for the next six months. I flew to India, and I wrote every day 180 letters. And I'm not a writer, but I became a writer. Six months later, I flew back from India straight to Philadelphia. Our second date, I said, what do you think? She said, the Lord has assured me that this is his direction for our lives. I will marry you. I said, amen. I'll not put you under pressure. Take all the time you need. But 10 weeks from now, you and I are scheduled to be back in India. And if you don't go, I'm not going to go. And thousands of people are dying. Go to hell. There's no pressure on you. Nine weeks later, we were married. And a week later, we were in India. Now, up to this point, it's a joyous story of new beginnings out of sadness, but into a new joy. The first night in India, I stood in front of 10,000 people and said, I want you to meet my wife, who was a widow. 10,000 people started talking to each other. He married a widow. He married a widow. He married a widow. This is 38 years ago. And India was quite different then than it is now, very traditional. At the end of the service, a leader came to me and said, David, for nine years... You have worked and lived and ministered in our country here in India, but you still don't understand. In a Hindu-Muslim world, an orphan is considered cursed of God because he has no father. In a Hindu-Muslim world, your greatest identity is your father. Your father. Without a father, you have no identity. And for a woman... Her husband is her identity. And without a husband, you have no identity. And if your husband dies, you are actually, in a sense, blamed for the death of your husband. You become a person whose life is over. And he said, no one marries a widow in India. And no widow would marry anyone else. Their life is over. It would be better if you'd never, ever, ever say, spoke again that Beth was a widow. 
I said, well, tomorrow morning I'm speaking to the pastors. He said, oh, share with them. I stood the next morning in front of 500 pastors, and I opened the scripture to what God says about orphans. God gives the most incredible scripture when he says, I am the father of the fatherless. The fatherless can declare, I am their father. And I went on to say, and here's the scriptures about widows. God says, I am the widow's protector, her defender, her provider, her covering. I am her identity. I am her identity. Something happened to those pastors. They fell on their faces and began to weep. They said, we have not followed the book. From this moment, we will embrace the orphan, for he's God is his father. And from this moment, the widow will be the most honored person in our church. For God is her covering, her defender, her protector, and her identity. Something happened that day 38 years ago. I brought a widow to India. And then God gave us two daughters. Now, among the Christians and among the educated and the well-to-do, daughters are wonderful. But 80% of India is extremely poor. And a daughter is considered a liability in a poor family. A son is considered an asset. When a son is born, there's, a re there's rejoicing. A son is born. When a daughter is born, there's sadness. A daughter, a liability. And God gave Beth and I two daughters. And daughters are wonderful. If you have a choice, take a daughter. They're the best. And let me assure you that no matter how many children you have and whether they're sons or daughters, it is your daughter who will choose your rest home. It is your daughter who will determine the rest of your life. It was true in our family. It's, it's true. Daughters. And God gave us two daughters. Now, in India, people are saying, we're praying we have a son. Pray. No, no, I said, I want a daughter. There's a special reason for this, and I think God knew. Project Rescue was on the horizon because after 25 years of planting churches and building Bible schools, training thousands of preachers, we opened a teen challenge center in the slums of Bombay, India, a city of 20 million people. And we stumbled into human trafficking and slavery. 100,000 little girls, most of them sold out of the mountains of Nepal. $200 for a little 12-year-old virgin from a Nepali village to be sold into a brothel in Bombay. 25 years in India, and I had never been in that part of the world. I never knew. I was like a blind person. And when our Teen Challenge staff took me through the red light district, I looked in the faces of 12-year-old little girls, 13-year-old little girls, heavily made up, provocatively dressed, and their eyes were dead. They had been raped repeatedly, brutalized, beaten, and broken. Most of them would be dead before they were 21 years of age. And I walked through those streets, looked in the eyes of those little girls, and God said, I gave you a widow for a wife. I gave you two daughters. And now there's a million of these little girls. The church is unaware. And nobody cares, it seems. But these are my daughters. And this is your ministry. Project Rescue was born. Hope starts here. The first night we said to the young women in the brothels, what can we do for you? They said, would you take our daughters to a place of safety? John 14, I go to prepare a place, a place, a place, a place for you. Now, he's talking about heaven. I'm talking about right now. Is there a place for a shattered, broken, violated little girl? Is there a safe place for those that have been so shattered by the lust and the greed of this world, is there a place? A place of healing, 
a place of salvation, a place of security, a place of comfort, a place of restoration. Is there a place? They said, if you could give our daughters a place, we said we will do it tonight. We opened our first shelter, our first home of hope. The first night they gave us 37 little girls. One madam walked out of a brothel with a little three-year-old by the hand and said, you can have this little girl. She's going to die anyway. Her mother died today. Her mother was sold out of a village in Nepal when she was 12 years old, trafficked to Bombay, raped and broken and beaten. At 16, she gave birth to a little girl. She was already HIV positive at 16, and the little three-year-old was born with the AIDS virus. At 19, she was dead at the Mother was dead of tuberculosis, and the little three-year-old was. We took the three-year-old and the 36 other little girls, and we opened our first place, our first shelter. And we began to minister to those as well as ministering still in the red light district to the young women. Wonderful, spirit-filled Indian doctor offered his medical services free of charge one day every week. For all of our children. Our pastors in Bombay would come and minister to our children. Women from the churches would come and cook, clean, and serve our children. That was just the beginning. Six months after we opened the first home, my Indian doctor friend phoned me and he said, David, in 30 years of medical ministry, I've seen many miracles, but the one I witnessed this week is the best. I tested the little three-year-old who was given to us HIV positive, and there's not a trace of the virus in her body. Jesus has stretched out his hand that is not short and his ear that is not heavy and has brought healing to that little girl. That little girl is now in Bible college preparing for the ministry. She was the first of what now thousands have come, and God has begun to touch them. That was the beginning. Now we have scores of homes, Bombay, Nagpur, Delhi, Calcutta, all over Nepal, Bangladesh, and now in Europe. Spain is now the brothel of Europe. 900,000 men every day in Spain purchase prostitution services. And most of the girls are not coming from Eastern Europe now, from Moldova and the other places around it. They're now coming from Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, West Africa. Thousands of African girls have been shipped, trafficked into Europe. The Assemblies of God in Spain have made it their cause to minister and reach out to those girls. We're involved deeply in the major cities of Spain and in France and in Europe now. The police in Grenoble, France called us. And they said, we have Nigerian girls who are street walkers. They're in prostitution on the streets. They speak English. They have a mixture of Christianity and demon possession in terms of the fact that when we try to get them off the streets, they say no. There is a, there is a curse that's been put on us. If we leave this life and leave the pimp, we will die and our families will die. And the police said, we don't know how to deal with that, but you guys are working with this type of population. And you all are Christians and you all are spiritual people. Can you help them? And we've been reaching out because in many of those cultures, Christianity sometimes is not as important as the village spellcaster. And the pimps work through that in a powerful sense. The United States of America, it is estimated that 3 million American men a day purchase prostitution services. The Justice Department can give you a solid estimate that there's 300,000 teenage girls in America in prostitution today. 98% of them are controlled by somebody. Drugs, violence. Even a misplaced sense of love has destroyed. And they are estimated that 500 teenage girls are recruited every single day 
and added to this huge population. Around the world, pornography has opened floodgates of brokenness, of violence, and of darkness. The homes in India, in one of my favorite homes, we have several homes in one particular area outside of Bombay, and one is just for children with AIDS. It's my favorite place. When I, Pastor Eric and his wife, who are dear friends and deeply involved with us in this ministry, they'll be coming to Bombay. And I want to take them to my favorite place is the AIDS home where a little girl will meet you at the door and take you by the hand and say, let me show you my place. That's where I came up with the word Eric the first time. She says, I want to show you my place. And she will take you to the first bed she's ever had that was just hers. Sleeping on the bed in her mother's room in a brothel was not a very safe place. And she'll say, this is my bed. This is my place. And this is my cupboard. Here's where I keep my stuff. And when you look at the staff for mothering her and praying over her, and you realize a place, just a place, a place of salvation, a place of healing, a place of new beginnings, a place to move on from darkness. You saw Devaraj on the video. We're now having Bible studies in the brothels. We've now purchased several brothels and turned them into churches in the red light district. Hallelujah. <laughs> and can you imagine a customer coming to the brothel and the madam saying, you have to wait a few minutes, they're having a Bible study. That's incredible to me. Prayer meetings. In the foyer, we have a couple of books available on the story of Project Rescue. The first one is called Beyond the Soil Curtain, Project Rescue's Fight for the Victims of the Sex Slave Industry. Somebody told my wife and I, you've got to write a book about what's happening in Bombay and the thousands and thousands of girls who've been rescued. What's happening behind the soil curtain? My wife said, no, no, no. Not what's behind the soil curtain, what's beyond the soil curtain. Not what's there, but what can God do to bring a new beginnings. Not for us to describe the situation, but to say this is what can be done. And this is our destiny, is to do something about it. As my wife said on the video, let's get beyond talking to action. Let's do something to make a difference in their destiny. The first book we wrote. Beyond the soil curtain, back page reads like this. 15-year-old Sumi peels back the soil curtain. She peers at the customer and watches the madam collect the money. For Sumi, this will be her ninth and hopefully last customer of the day. When she's complied with the sexual demand, she'll be released to attend a church service conducted by Project Rescue. We have planted a church in the heart of hell, in the heart of the red light district. And hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of girls have come to that church. Because you see, in a Hindu-Muslim world, particularly India, a Hindu can always go to the temple and is encouraged to do so every day. The Muslim can go to the mosque. And a Christian or someone who desires to come to a Christian church, even though they're a slave, is permitted to come to church. And there they're finding freedom and healing, and hope, and a new beginning. There's a second book out in the lobby. It's called Beyond the Shame, Project Rescue's Fight to Restore Dignity to Survivors of Sexual Slavery. You saw on the screen 32,000 girls have been touched. Vocational training, medical care, counseling, and years of love and prayer. And the girls say the last thing they struggle with is shame. How do I tell somebody where I was born? How do I tell somebody I don't have a father? How do I tell somebody who I was before Jesus? Beyond the shame. My wife preaches a great sermon called Shattering the Shame. But I want to speak to every heart in this room today. All of us struggle with shame. It's not just our girls in Europe and India and here in the States. Every person has a measure of shame in their life. God wants to take you beyond the paralysis that happens because of shame.
to a place of freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom. As you glance through or read through the pages of this book, and these books are available for a $5 donation. It simply covers the cost of printing and shipping the book. One of the girls was so violently assaulted in a brothel, her mind snapped. She escaped from a brothel with no clothes on, running through the streets, screaming like a wounded animal, found, covered, brought to a home of hope. God restored her mind over a period of a year and called her into the ministry. Three years later, Beth and I were at the Bible College graduation, and they asked my wife to hand out the diplomas to all the graduates. And a young, beautiful young woman in a purple sari came walking across the platform to receive her diploma, graduating from Bible College, ready to enter the ministry. And everybody started crying and cheering and clapping. And the director looked at me and he said, you don't recognize her, do you? I said, no, I'm sorry. He said, she's in your book. She's the girl her mind snapped from the violence in the brothel. And God brought healing to her mind and called her to ministry. She has now graduated from Bible college, and she's coming back to the red light district to rescue other girls like herself. And I stood there and wept like a baby. He's the God of new beginnings. He takes a 27-year-old young widow and a 31-year-old person and says, this is God's beginning for your life. We cannot fix all the things in our past, but God is not there to fix the things in the past. He's there to start you over. A new beginning in Christ Jesus. Now, there are memories and I stood in our church in the red light district, and we're opening more churches. Just last week, we purchased a new, another brothel, and we're turning it into a house church because our goal is to plant churches in near, at the doorway to hell. As one missionary put it, I'd rather build a rescue shop at the doorway to hell than any other place. In our church, which meets on Saturday night, I stood there where a 19-year-old one night was testifying. She said I was sold from a village in Nepal several years ago and the violence of the past several years. She said, you can see the scars, but you can't see the scars in my mind. Scars that are like jagged glass of what's happened to me in the last few years. But she said, when I came to Jesus and he rescued me, he not only washed my blood, he washed my memories. My memories are there, but they're not like jagged glass. Those memories are now under the blood of Jesus Christ. I sat there and wept at the healing of memories. We helped send her to nursing college. She graduated, became a nurse. A young man came through our, our Teen Challenge program out of drugs and gangs, and God saved him and called him to the ministry. We sent him to Bible college. He graduated and came back, was preaching all over Bombay, and met this young nurse. Then he came to us and said, she's the one for me. She and I came from the same world, and God brought us into a new world. Please arrange my marriage with her. A few weeks later, I was standing at the same altar that that young woman had testified about the healing of her memories four years before, and I stood there when we married her and this young preacher. He's the God of new beginnings. He's the God who takes the most broken and shattered and starts a new beginning all over again. I stand here as a preacher's kid who grew up in a church that would have a hard time understanding when I was a kid what all is this about. I spent 25 years in India and knew nothing of all this. But the last 20 years has been an incredible journey. And then one of those wonderful things was that girls that we took as children, they are now graduating from high school and going off to university and college. And one said to me the other day, Uncle, can I go to Bible college? I said, sure, why not? She says, well, Uncle, I have no father. My mother's dead. How do I go to college? 
I said, we will send you. We will send you. And my son-in-law was there. And he's kind of in the business world. And he said, why don't we create a scholarship T-shirt and put it online that this T-shirt will scholarship a girl going to Bible school or nursing school. So we did. We put these T-shirts online, projectrescue.com, and there they are. We have raised $150,000 off T-shirts. And we have got over 100 girls in college and university today based on T-shirts. And God has raised up people who will invest and give and be a part of all this. One little seven-year-old girl was brought in out of a brothel. Her mother died. And her mother's last word was, the people from Home of Hope will take care of my daughter. They brought this little seven-year-old in. This is in a different city and a different doctor that I talked about earlier. And he examined her and he said, David, I don't think. I don't think she'll live. The malnutrition of seven years, the diseases that's in her body, not AIDS, but the other things, I don't think she'll make it. Beautiful little seven-year-old, her arms and legs big as my finger. The other one's skin and bones. She could speak several languages. It's amazing what you learn in a brothel. She could speak very good English. I became her adopted uncle. Every free moment, she'd come and wrap her fingers around my little finger, just sit there and hold my hand. She'd go to church with me. She'd go to prayer meeting. She'd sit beside me in the lunchtime. Came time for me to leave, and I took her in my arms. I said, honey, Uncle David's got to go. I'll be back in six weeks, and I'll see you then. That little dark-eyed girl looked up at me and said, no, Uncle David, I won't be here when you come back. I won't be here. I'll never see you again. My throat closed. Tears ran down my face. I couldn't say, oh, you'll be all right, because I knew she wasn't going to be all right unless God did a miracle. Unable to speak, tears in my face, she reached up a tiny hand and brushed her tears off my cheek and preached the greatest sermon I've ever heard. She said, don't worry about me, Uncle David. I've got Jesus. Don't worry about me. I sat her back down on the floor and walked out and got on the plane. Every church I went to for the next six weeks, I told her story and asked people to pray for a miracle for that little girl. And I confess to you embarrassedly this morning, that was one I had no faith in. I just prayed prayers of desperation. Six weeks later, I flew back into India and stepped out of the airport, and that little girl came screaming down the sidewalk, Uncle David. I picked her up and said the stupidest thing I've ever said in my life. I said, honey, what are you doing here? I, I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I was stunned. She said, Jesus has healed me. I'm perfectly normal. And I've been adopted by a Christian family. I have a new mother. And Uncle David, I have a daddy for the first time in my life. And I stood there with tears of joy this time, running down my face because he's the God of new beginnings. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house is a place. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, I will come and get you and take you to that place. Jesus says, you know the way. And Thomas says, how can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When I drove in this morning, this area is so beautiful, Cheshire, Connecticut. There's a lot of beauty in this area. But there's a lot of sadness behind the doors of the homes in this community. They may not be in India, even though there's a lot of Indians in this community. They may feel like we have all of the necessary things in life. But broken hearts, shattered dreams are all over this community. And God has put Cornerstone here as a healing place. A healing for the community, a healing for families, a place of deliverance. 
and a place of giving to the whole world. And I stand here this morning to represent a million little girls that desperately need somebody to give them a place. And your offering today is going to make a difference. And please pick up a couple of our books, one or two out there on the table. My wife's book that just came out, Courageous Compassion. I don't have it available this morning. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle. But I am going to send some this week, and it will be available next Sunday. Courageous Compassion. I have it in Spanish, <laughs> but I don't have it in English this morning. But I am praying that Courageous Compassion become a part of your life, a part of your life. I stand here this morning, and I think not only of your face that I can see, but I think of your heart. Hearts that can be hardened by sadness, the death of someone you deeply love. Sickness, disease, fear, loss hardens our heart. And I prayed early this morning, Lord, give us soft hearts. Pastor Eric stood and he said, part of the problem like with the Supreme Court in America is hearts. Moses, Jesus said, Moses gave them divorce because of the hardness of their heart. And as pastor encouraged us in the first service and the second service to pray for the hearts of America, the hearts of the Supreme Court, the heart of the president, the heart of leaders, but most of all, the hearts of the young people of this nation. My older daughter graduated from Evangel University with a degree in education and theater. And went on and did a master's degree in using theater as therapy for abused children. And at 24 years of age, she went back to India as a missionary, working in New Delhi, in the brothels, in dangerous places, to build a new home of hope in Delhi. Four years later, came back and married Tyler. And now they are back in India as missionaries. They have a little two-and-a-half-year-old son, Judah our first grandchild. And four days ago, they're back in the States at the moment to have another little, and they had a baby girl four days ago. Ella Grace was just born. Our younger daughter, Jennifer, has a 23-year-old, 23-month-old little girl, Gemma. And seven weeks ago, had another little baby girl, Madison. We have four grandkids. And today, I am rejoicing as a grandfather. I said to our daughters, we should have had them first. They are so much fun, so much fun. It is absolutely wonderful. And I looked at little Ella Grace four days ago when she was born, and I wept. And I said, Lord, Ella Grace will grow up to know you. But what about the other little girls that will never know you unless somebody makes a place for them? I landed in Calcutta 45 years ago in the middle of a civil war in Bangladesh when 9 million Bangladeshi refugees fled out of Bangladesh into Calcutta. They filled the city 45 years ago. There was a water pipe just outside of where I was staying, and a refugee family moved into that pipe. They had a little 5-year-old girl, those, a little 2-year-old boy. The little five-year-old girl wore a burlap sack, no shoes, and I saw her nothing, anything except that burlap sack. The little boy wore nothing, two years old. Every morning when I would pass that pipe, going to the feeding program, where our church was feeding thousands of refugees every morning, on my way to the feeding program, I'd pass that pipe, and the man and wife would be gone looking for work or food. The little girl and the boy would be standing there at the edge of the pipe. And they would wave at me as I'd go by, and I'd wave. And I began to study Bengali right away. One morning, the little girl became very bold. She stepped over to the sidewalk and grabbed my pants leg. 
And in Bengali, she said, Mister, we're hungry. Can you help us? I said, I'll be back in a minute. Down to the feeding program. I took the largest plate of food, and I brought it back to that pipe, and I handed it to that little girl. She nodded to her baby brother to go inside, and she sat down and fed him for 10 minutes and never put a bite of food in her mouth. When he finished all he wanted, he passed the plate back, and she finished what was left. I was 22 years of age. I was standing there, just arrived in Calcutta, looking at those two kids, tears running down my face, and I wanted to say, little refugee girl from Bangladesh, you wear a burlap sack. You don't even have shoes on your feet. You all have fled for your life, and you're living in a water pipe. But I've never seen anyone like you. You would not eat until you fed your brother first. And if God will help me from this day forward, I will never eat first again. Never again will I eat first. Somebody else will eat before I do. I made that vow to God 45 years ago. And the first check we write every month is to feed a thousand kids in our part of the world. Someone said to me, David, what gets you up in the morning? Well, we got a couple thousand little girls. But somebody's got to make a place for them. And I'm saying to you today, don't eat first. And realize that when the gospel is preached, you've heard it hundreds of times. And half the world has never heard it one time. God wants your heart to be broken for the same things his heart is broken for. And he wants your hands to be his hands. Our younger daughter became a nurse. Went back to Calcutta and worked in Mother Teresa's home for the destitute and dying the first few weeks. She said, Daddy, I would pray for the little women they brought in out of the slums to die in dignity. But I couldn't do it with gloves on my hands. I had to take the gloves off and cradle their face in my hands and whisper in their ear, His name is Jesus. And you will see him very soon. Your hands can be the hands of Jesus. Would you stretch them out right now for a moment? Every hand in this place, would you lift them up? Just stretch them out and say, Lord Jesus, these are your hands. I give them to you. Let these hands bring freedom, healing, deliverance. Right here in America and in India and in Europe, and around the world. Take my hand, Lord. Let it be the hand of Jesus. Let it bless. Let it heal in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Put your hand right over your heart and pray this prayer with me as the pastor comes. Just put your hand right over your heart. Say this prayer with me and believe it with all your heart. Lord Jesus, there is a place in my heart just for you. Come, Lord Jesus, fill that place. With my heart, I believe. And with my mouth, I confess. Jesus Christ is my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins, washing me with your precious blood, healing the hardness, the stoniness, in my heart. Give me this morning at Cornerstone Church a new heart, a new spirit, a new direction, a new destiny in Jesus Christ. Can we lift our hands and give Him praise for a moment? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Come by the table. I'd like to meet you and greet you, but right now we're going to pray. You prayed that prayer today, and you know, it's very simple. God made you. You're designed by God for God. Until you gave your life to God, you're going to hurt yourself and others. We're made by Him, for Him. And so I don't know where you are today. If you prayed that prayer today and you gave your life to Christ, and it's a wonderful new beginning. You know what? It's just right. We're made for Him. I just want to give an opportunity. It's, I, I'm, I'm very privileged uh, to, to be a part of this church. 
I'm very privileged for outstanding people. We have the privilege of partnering with that, that you are going around the world to India with Project Rest because we support them. We just started supporting them again, and we're excited about it. And as a matter of fact, I didn't even know this, but we, our gentleman in the back, he's been coming here relatively new to the church. His name is Arnold. He's been running the sound for it. Where's Arnold? There's Arnold. Arnold, come real quickly. Arnold, I just found out that Arnold went to India and saw the, um, saw the brothels and literally saw what you just heard about. You know, sometimes people can come with great stories, but this has like great integrity. What, what, what happened a couple of years ago? I was able to go to uh, India into a village called Bolari. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's an area that the women, the girls, 13 years old, have to go to a Hindu ritual, and they marry a Hindu god, and they can't refuse anyone in their village and any, any man. And uh, this Pastor Setian, who I think you know, is now a pastor of a, a church at that time was 2,000 there was you know, about 600 people of these women coming out of here. And when you see, I've seen David in his ministry for 20 years. I've watched you. And the impact which he's made, but God's called you to the lowly. And they're not lowly. We look down on them, but God looks up to them. And it's just when you see it firsthand, it just, it just impacts your life. Thank you so much, Arnold. Arnold, uh, Arnold uh, attended a church for nearly 20 years, and the dear friends of our family, tremendous church in New Jersey, and we were privileged to have him part of our church. But it's just wonderful, guys, that we can make a difference across, across the street, around the world. Amen. So we want to be able to bless this entire offering. You don't have to, you get to. That's what God loves a cheerful giver. So, Father... We want to thank you for the great things you are doing. Father, we know we're not here just to entertain ourselves and to live a comfortable life. We're here to be your hands and your feet. And Father, we thank you so much for Project Rescue. We thank you for the incredible ministry that is happening through David Grant and his wife. Lord, we thank you for Beth and, and David and their children and, and what you're doing. We just ask this often we be blessed. And Father, we know that when we bless what you're doing, we get blessed back we can be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. This completely goes 100% to Project Rescue, and so I'm excited that we can do that. So let's just take a few moments to do that. And, and as we're doing that, and as we're having the offering, go ahead, ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and do that. We want to also give you an opportunity to, to, if you need prayer for anything at all, we believe God answers prayer. We've seen God literally do miracles here. We've seen people healed of all sorts of issues. I have a report of hepatitis being healed at the prayer. So things like that, God is doing great stuff. And so it's because we believe that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and through the access of Jesus Christ. So if you, I'm going to ask our prayer team to make their way up. We're going to conclude here just in a few moments. If you want to have an opportunity uh, to sow into this wonderful ministry that uh, it's a privilege and honor to be a part of. Isn't it great that not all of us can go around the world, but we can go around the world through prayer and by partnering together. And, and you know, Dave, I would like to very much uh, come and visit you in India and uh, maybe I'll take a little team with me because uh, I don't like going alone anymore. I want to bring people with me. So I come back, you get the fire too. And it's important to do that. And, you know, we reach down the street. We're going to, by the way, we're going to have a uh, Cornerstone Serve Day. I think it's August the 15th. We're going to ask everyone to serve in our local communities, go into homeless shelters, different places. We want to serve as a church and touch our community for those that are less fortunate that, went, that are, you know, we want to make a difference by helping all of us understand that there's needs around the block and around the world. Okay, so let's all stand if we could. We'll have a concluding prayer. <clears throat> and as we do that, I'm going to also ask that uh, you'll, if you want to meet uh, Pastor Grant, he'll be in the lobby right after in the foyer, right by the book table uh, to do that. And so uh, let's just go ahead and, and have a closing benediction. It comes from the book of Jude. One of my favorite benedictions is what it says. It says, verse 25 of Jude 1, all glory to him. Verse 24. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling. Isn't that great to know? God helps us. He keeps you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence with a, without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time in the present 
and beyond all time. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. Have a fantastic day. If you'd like to have some prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, we dismiss you now. God bless you.